How's everybody doing today? Wanted to talk about a, a facet of the Christian life that is put very starkly a few times in Scripture, and yet, for whatever reason, we still see an unfortunately large number of Christians and so-called Christians living very much in defiance of this very, very clear um, warning and guidance, uh, specifically the parable of the unmerciful servant. This is a parable that starts off with Peter basically asking how many times he should forgive his brother. Seven times, you know, the you know, perfect number seven. Christ steps in and says you should forgive him 77 times. The implication not that you should stop at 77 times, but that you should forgive him as often as it takes for him to be able to advance past um, the same offense, right? So if, if, this is a, if this is the sin easily besets him and he can't help but continue to commit this sin, but you know his heart, at least from the, express, the expression of his repentance that he wants to change. And um, the reason why this is so imperative is not because we know exactly which time we forgive him is effectively going to be the time where he stands up, makes the right decision, and moves on from these past behaviors. But the implication is that it's expected, and in fact implied repeatedly throughout Scripture, that once we come to faith, repentance is an ongoing matter as far as, well, our whole bodies are white, according to the Lord's word when he was washing their feet during the uh, the supper before he paid for our sin. But we also see that if we don't allow him to come wash our feet, we can have no part in him. Uh, expressing Expressing the fact that as we go along, even though we are in a position of being saved, we can still pick up dirt because we're in the sinful world. If it wasn't for the fact that we were able to come to him repeatedly and constantly throw ourselves on his mercy, how could we ever advance? We're told repeatedly all throughout the New Testament to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, the implication being you're going to fall, you're going to fail, he's going to pick you up, he's going to forgive you, and you're going to advance. You're going to keep going. And even though it's going to feel like constantly falling on your face because of the grace of God and our desire to turn over our lives to him and, and his spirit and his guidance as far as the steps we take each day in his spirit, again, a willful submission of our will, we eventually are able to move past these things. But if it wasn't for the Lord being willing to constantly forgive us over and over and over again, we wouldn't have that. And we are told in this parable very specifically that we are to express this forgiveness, pay it forward, if you will, uh, to any and all who commit these same types of consistent sin against us. In other words, we're not supposed to love our lives so much that we are unwilling to be forgiving for, for others when we are forgiven so much repetitively. In this particular parable, the master brings forth a particular servant who has a massive debt. Uh, he says, sell all your goods, family, you're going to have to pay me this debt back. The man, of course, freaks out, loses it, likely is bawling his eyes out, begging for mercy. The master, instead of just giving him more time, turns around and just repays the whole debt. So in other words, the man no longer owes any money, but then he turns around once he's released from his debt and goes and finds one of his debtors, one of his fellow workers that owes him 100 denarii, a very small amount compared to the amount he owed to the master and physically accosts him, then tries to throw him in jail and in fact effectively throws him in jail for not paying him back this small amount that's owed. Well, the main master finds out about it and says, how dare you hold this against this man when I've forgiven you so much? And then he throws him in jail and says, you're going to stay here until you pay off this debt. Now, the Lord does interject and expresses the difference in realities for Christians versus the man in this particular parable that the father will treat us as such until we are forgiving of others in our heart. We also see this exact same thing, uh, theme rather in, uh, I believe it's Matthew 6, 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts of others. It's automatically assumed that because we have accepted so much forgiveness that we are going to be forgiving. And again, because of this, this, peril, this parable, we can infer, I think quite rightly, that if we get to a point to where we are constantly holding things against others while constantly being forgiven and not expressing that forgiveness in our everyday life, paying it forward once again, uh, we are putting ourselves in a position to be judged in this life for our egregious actions in not representing Christ appropriately. If the Father has forgiven us so much because of the work, unfortunately, that Christ had to go through, it is an utter disgrace and denigration of all of that suffering and torture that he went through for us to not have the same exact mindset towards others and their behavior towards us. Our ministry is the outreach program of Christ here on earth. If we're spending time having this mindset of condemnation and, and judgmental behavior towards others who are supposed to be our closest family, 
how quickly is this going to turn somebody off who perhaps is looking towards Christ, sees you as a believer, but then sees your unforgiving tendencies? They're going to automatically impugn God as being this way because of your behavior. We've all met somebody like this. And in fact, all throughout the New Testament, Christ warns against the, the behaviors and the hip hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees very much for this reason. At the time of Christ, legalism and utter false religion had completely taken over true faith. Today, we have the ability, unfortunately, and this is just because of free will, we have the ability to accept Christ's forgiveness and yet still have a legalistic mindset where we think that perhaps we're doing something for God by avoiding sin or by you know, actively engaging in the process of judging others in their sin as if we somehow have perfect control of it ourselves. All this is going to do, again, just like with the unbeliever in the case of the believer, it's going to make them feel as though they can never do it. Perhaps they look up to you. Perhaps they've seen that you've been a believer for a certain period of time and they accept your judgmental words as somehow equal to what the Lord might have to say about the matter regarding the Bible. This is really common. The legalistic person goes out of their way to express a holier-than-thou mindset and puts it across to others, believers and unbelievers alike, that somehow they have control over their sin nature in a way that nobody else does. And they think that therefore, because they have this control, that they somehow have the right to judge and condemn and hold things against others, when this is not only exceedingly detrimental to your own salvation, because it may lead the, uh, the judge-er, in this case, eventually to come to some position that they might actually be right or that their behavior is actually doing or adding anything to their salvation. The real outcome for the, for the legalist in the real world, unfortunately, is really only one of two things. Either they're going to hold on to Christ, hold on to their vindictive, unforgiving, um, unrepentant nature, and eventually suffer the sin unto death with this increasing level of um, punishment coming by way of the Father. In this case, they're thrown in jail until their debt is paid. If they don't relinquish that state of mind, that, 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 that position in their heart of unforgiveness, eventually they are going to be taken out because they have essentially determined to live their life in contrast uh, to the proper witness that we are taught to have every day uh, in, in, our, in our walk regarding how we live our lives to Christ in front of others. The other option is, of course, this person will eventually come to a place where they think that their actions actually do anything for salvation. And they become convinced in their mind that somehow if they don't continue doing what they're doing in their overly defensive, anti-sin uh, state of mind, that they somehow uh, will lose their salvation if they don't, they don't do the thing that they think they need to do. Then unfortunately, the other side of the outcome for the legalist is apostasy. And all of this could have been avoided had they accepted the Lord's um, forgiveness and, and forgiving uh, the command of being forgiving towards others. A lot could have gone uh, in this person's favor, but instead they decided to wreck it, thinking that somehow they knew better. We would all do well to remember that when we ask forgiveness, we must be forgiving. We can't treat this life in such a way that we become the respecter of persons that we know God is not. Um, we should never demand fealty from fellow believers, and we should certainly not demand that we somehow have sin perfectly conquered in this life, because all that's going to do, again, is make the Lord look very unsavory. It's going to, um, it's going to deeply anger the Father, and it's going to bring about horrific punishment for the one acting these behaviors. And we would all do well to stay as far away from this particular type of legalistic judgmentalism as possible. Let me know what you guys think tried not to ramble, tried not to go on too much. I think these parables are awesome because they express these, um, these genuine and deep truths in a very vivid way, uh, and I'm hoping that they're useful. Let me know what you think. We'll talk to you soon.